As I said at the beginning of this service, I've been thinking about demon possession all week. And I remember that little passage, as I said earlier, in the eighth chapter of Luke's gospel, where there's this little, it's just a throwaway little passage. I miss it if I'm not paying attention. It's just a little list of women who were demon possessed and, and healed of that. And their names are Mary and Susanna and Joanna. And Mary, I know, and you do too, but Susanna and Joanna, those are names that were just not real, real top of mind. Hmm. So demon possession is real, and I want to talk about it. Everybody I know, maybe I'm preaching to the angel congregation, but everybody else I know, if it's not you, gets demon possessed from time to time. It's just a part of life. I was demon-possessed yesterday. Some of y'all might have come in here demon-possessed. Let me define demon possession. A demon is an outside force that gets inside of you and gets control of you, so you do things you don't want to do. You care about things you do not want to care about, and you worry about things that in truth aren't really worth worrying about at all. One way we sometimes put it is, you ever feel like somebody or something has rent-free space in your head? You don't want to think about him, her, or it, but you cannot stop thinking about him, her, or it. You try to evict them or at least make them pay a high sum, and they're just stuck in there, rent-free. This happens to human beings all the time. I don't know if there are any in the room right now. You go to bed thinking about what you don't want to think about. You wake up thinking about that which you desperately don't want to think about. If you were in your right mind and not demon-possessed at the time, you wouldn't give him, her, or it the time of day. But you're not in your right mind. You happen to be possessed by a demon. So you give him, her, or it all of your time and bandwidth. That's demon possession. Does anybody in here know what I am talking about? Oh, oh, good! Now, if you're possessed by a demon, as I said I was yesterday, if you're possessed by a demon, there's a couple of things you can do. The first thing to do is identify what this demon possession is not. It is not of God. The demon possession that is consuming you is not of God. Which means if you're feeling anxious and frantic, just sort of driven about, always in this manic, frenetic hustle, you can be certain that Jesus has not led you in to this anxious, frantic pace and place. You can also be assured that Jesus will meet you in the wilderness of your worry and lead you out of it if you'll let Him. Jesus' two favorite words, they're all over the gospel, are follow me. Follow me. The trick is, i got to put one foot in front of the other and follow him. The trick is, i got to offload the burden of my frantic demon possession to the one who can carry it. Let me put this on the street. Years ago, I knew a man who was demon-possessed. I knew him well. I knew him in a very personal way. He was a businessman who'd been in business for 60, 70 some odd years. And towards the end of his career, right before he hung it up, he had a long run of bad luck. And this man I knew got it in his head 
that his business failures were the totality of his identity. He was possessed of this demon. And that little demon thought that his identity, his worth was indelibly tied to his failures. It wedged his way into his mind, and over time, it got a hold of him, and he got a hold of it. And the two couldn't have been torn apart by wild horses. This man I knew was convinced, utterly convinced, that a piece of real estate, a piece of property with a big building on it that he owned in the middle of the little town where he'd lived forever, was worth more than anyone wanted to pay for it. Which mean what? No one bought it. And it sat empty and unused. Season after season, year after year, he drove by it day after day. He thought about all of his neighbors who drove by his empty piece of property day after day. And then he, oh, he didn't mean to. It was almost as if it was by accident. Over the years, he accidentally got his own self-worth tied to the worth of that property. And from there, it was all downhill. He was possessed. His identity tied to what he perceived to be his failure. And his friends and his family, of whom he had many, Camped out in his life, they'd come to his house, trying to get him to follow them out of that wilderness of his worry by their love, but they never could get the man to step in to the light. On the last day of the man's life, his beloved wife got up earlier than usual, determined to pull the man out of the pit of his despair. And she fried a pan full of bacon for him on the stove in the kitchen of their home. More bacon than anyone should eat probably in a year, maybe a lifetime. But she knew that the man, her beloved husband, loved bacon. And she thought even just the smell of it filling the house, much less a full plate of it, would cheer him up some way. You see, she tried everything else she knew to do. Just as she was putting the bacon on the plate, the man died. That's true. He died of a broken heart in the back bedroom of their home. Never got what she'd prepared for him. Of course, right after he drew his last breath, the man carted off to heaven, where he, like all of us one day, met Jesus face to face. And the demons that had possessed him for so long ran for the hills, because that's what they do when our Lord is in the midst. And that man realized, in the moment after his death, that all he was was all he'd ever been, which was God's favorite son. You know, I haven't been to that man's little town in quite some time. I doubt that property ever has sold. But I do know that it never, that property and its worth or worthlessness, never had anything at all to do with that man's worth. The truth is, he was a prince of a guy, one of my favorite people. He just didn't know it. He couldn't see it. He was demon-possessed. About 10 years ago, I knew of a woman down in Texas. Didn't know her personally, but I had a good friend who was a good friend of hers. She was down in Texas, and she was demon-possessed. She had a pretty terrible cancer. And though cancer is a demon in and of itself, the demon that possessed her was her constant worry and fear about her disease. She couldn't get it off her mind. It was totally consuming. It was all she thought about ever. She dreamed about it. One day, 
trying against long odds to get free. She was in her home studying the Gospels. And as she read through the story of Jesus and his followers, she began to see, as if for the first time, that Jesus was teaching in the Gospels that the kingdom of God is everywhere. And in an instant, the woman said later, she decided in a moment of pure faith that her cancer, which was all over her body at that point, was the kingdom of God. She called up my friend, they were close, the very next day after this realization, and she said to my friend, I've had a breakthrough. I feel the load has been totally lifted. My cancer is the kingdom of God. My friend said he could kind of feel her smile through the phone. But my friend was very confused by what she'd said. He tried to be polite, but he, he just sort of blurted out, what? Well, what? What on earth are you saying? And she said, I know it sounds strange, but I believe that there is nowhere that God is not. And my friend said, well, sure, yeah, me too. And she said, the kingdom of God is everywhere if we have eyes to see. So I've decided that that includes my cancer. I'm not going to let it eat up my body and steal my identity. I am God's girl, she said, and my cancer is the kingdom of God. I accept it and I offer it to Jesus in faith. A few months later, this woman and my friend were together again at a meeting. And after the meeting, my friend approached the woman and he said, ah, how are you doing? And he asked with a a kind of depth of concern because he could see that she was not doing well. And she answered his question, how are you doing? In a most serene voice, he told me. She said with a sort of angelic lilt, oh, I'm doing very well. And my friend said, are you? And his eyes fixed on her bald head. And she said, oh yes, the, the cancer is back and it's, it's bad, as bad as it's ever been. But I have a relationship with God that would knock your socks off. Come what will, God's got me and life goes on. When my buddy called me and told me that story, I said, I love you and I love life, but that's not a true story. Come on, man, are you coming? This is a little hyperbole you're spinning. He said, I knew you were going to say that. It's true, I was there. God is my witness. That is what she said. And then we realized together, my friend and I on the phone, she knew who she was. She was a daughter of God in need of mercy and love, just like everybody else. That was the totality of her identity. The demons were gone. A little while after that, the woman died. I always remembered that story. You know, it's 10 years ago. And it came back to me when I was preparing this. My cancer is the kingdom of God. And I wrote it down just like you've just heard it. And then last night, kind of late in the game for the preacher who's going to preach on Sunday morning, I began to have doubts. Because if I tell a story, I want it to be true. I'm not going to tell you a story that's not true. I promise you that. I never have and I never will. So I called my buddy on the phone. And I was a little nervous asking because I didn't have much time. If If I was mistaken, I had to rewrite this whole thing. And you know, well, here we are. And I said to him, this is what I've said, and this, this is the story I remember, but it's been a long time since we talked about it. Am I remembering this correctly? Long pause, he said, it's, it's as true as ever it was, and what you have said is exactly what happened. And I said to him, one thing I don't remember about your story, her story, y'all's story, is what was the woman's name? 
It's nice when you tell a story. You don't have to, but if, if the... And he thought for a second. And then he said, Joanna. And I said, no. <laughs> I refuse that. There is no way on God's green earth that woman down in Texas was named Joanna. No! He said, baby, I don't know what to tell you. Her name was Joanna. I remember it like my own name. I was at her funeral. Her name was a Joanna. The moment Joanna drew her last breath was the finish line and the starting line because life goes on. She pulled into heaven, racing into the arms of Jesus Christ, who said to her, Welcome home, Joanna! The demons had long been gone from Joanna's body. She gave them to Jesus in faith some time before. And now in paradise, the cancer was gone too. This is what faith will do. You see, when Jesus healed someone in the Gospels, He often said to them, your faith has made you well. You did it! Partnering with God, your faith has made you well. So I ask you this morning, and ask myself as well, what's gotten into you? No, 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 I mean it. What's gotten into you? Is there something that has gotten in you, that has stolen your identity? If there is, hear me say this. You are not your sickness. You are not your misfortune. You are not your failure. You are not your abuse. You are not your divorce. You are not whatever is in you right now. That is not you. Now be careful, because you ain't your wins either. You're not your successes. You're not your good look, good luck. You're not your good looks. You're not your celebrations. You are God's son. Hear me say this. You are God's daughter. You belong to Jesus. Have faith in his mercy and be healed. Demons, be gone. Amen.